today is another stitch with hello my papers welcome to Shalene's creativity room today is another stitch with me and a book so today's stitching is summer goodies by Shannon Christine it is a start along that Shannon Christine is doing on Facebook there is a group for it and today's book is called I Let You Fall by Sarah Downing. This was a really good book. It was given to me by a publisher. So here's a description of the book. On a summer night in London, art teacher Eve Chapman finds herself in a hospital emergency room. She watches surgeons desperately operate on a young woman with a terrible head injury. But when the bandages are removed, Eve is horrified to find her own body on the operating table. Trapped in a coma, Eva struggles. Eve struggles to cope with the fact that no matter how hard she tries, her family and friends cannot see or hear her. But then she meets Luca Diaz, a handsome and comatose lawyer who can see her. He takes Eve under his wing and teaches her how to use her new abilities to help the living. As the weeks pass, Eve struggles to find a way back to her body and to Nathan, the man she loves. But the more time she spends with Luca, the more she wonders if her old life is worth going back to at all. And here we go. Prologue. Six weeks after the accident. It's joyful weather, a day for looking up rather than down, for seeing the blue of the sky latticed with vapor trails, not the grime of the dusty pavements. As the doors open, she blinks her way into the brightness. Outside at last, space, freedom. The sounds of the city are all the more vivid for her separation from them. A breeze swishing the tips of the trees, horns blaring, and a siren whining somewhere far off, the multilingual babble of passers-by. This is the real London, not the version she is used to seeing from upstairs. Muffled into silence by double-glazed glass, snapshotted into a single scene and bordered by a window frame. She takes a moment to gaze around as though seeing everything for the first time. She descends the steps, nervously finding her footing, unsteady in the crowds for that, that for so long she has only observed from on high. With her nose pressed to the window, she would write their stories in her head, create imaginary lives for them to while away the hours. How different it is to be among them now, creating a narrative for herself at last. An open-topped bus crawls past. Tourists leap to their feet to snap at anything and everything. Shutters clicking as they capture the two-door turrets of Lambeth Palace on one side, the distant Houses of Parliament on the other. What will they see of her in their photos, she wonders? A misplaced shadow on the pavement? An unexplained shape, like a fingerprint smudge on a lens? It cannot be anything more substantial, she is sure. A party of school children nears the crossing ahead, neatly two by two and dressed in mini high vis jackets. Her heart melts at their innocence and their constant chatter. Two teachers lead, clutching the hands of the first pair. The group concert concertinas like a huge fidgety caterpillar as they wait to be led across the road. She hears the motorbike before she sees it, at first a low purr on the far side of Lambeth Bridge, louder as it continues at speed across the Thames. 
then a thunder and roar against the idling hum of slower moving vehicles. The children are crossing now. A teacher with a smile almost as wide as her open arms beckons them across the lane. The bike takes the corner into the roundabout, leaning low to one side. The biker's knee almost grazes the ground, and as the traffic lights flip to red, there is no time for him to react. In that split second, a feeling of certainty settles upon her. This is it. Her moment. Her reason for being here today, outside the safety of her room. She rushes onto the crossing and throws herself between the children and the bike. She sees a flicker of fear in the teacher's eyes before she closes her own and prays to a God she has never truly believed in. She hears the rider's muffled groan beneath his helmet as he realizes what is about to happen. There is a screech of rubber on asphalt and she feels the impact deep in her core. And after, the noise becomes silence. Part one making sense. Chapter one, the day after the accident. The mechanical click of a ventilator marked the seconds and minutes since the battle was won. As the medical team yanked at blood spattered gloves, Eve shuddered at the squawk of latex on skin. Through the small hours of the morning, she had watched them operate on this woman drill into her skull in the race to save her, her head a mess of blood and bone. Between the dressings and an oxygen mask, only a small area of the woman's face was now visible. Her skin was so pallid, so dead looking, how is it possible that she could still be alive? Well done, everyone, said the older of the two surgeons, stretching his arms to the ceiling. This was a tough one. We were lucky. Go home and get some rest. Lucy, would you mind speaking to the parents first? Eve had been surprised to find herself there, unqualified as she was for any role in an operating theater. But she had witnessed this woman's fight for life, seen her blood spill. So walking away wasn't an option. Nathan would be wondering where she was and Buster mewing over an empty bowl, but they would have to wait. So what happens now, said Eve. A nurse leant over the patient, checking the machinery, the wires and tubes which fed into the woman. You've been through it, haven't you, she said, sighing. She turned away and began to sort through a pile of paperwork on the counter behind her. How long will she be like this? asked Eve. They were interrupted by a face at the window, and a porter pushed open the door. As the nurse turned to greet him, Eve was struck by the man's height and by his wide smile and twinkling eyes. All for this nurse's benefit, she was sure. Glad to see you, said the nurse. Lots to move. Where is she off to then, Neem? said the porter kicking the brake lever on the trolley and turning it around. He grabbed the smaller trolley, which housed the equipment with his other hand. A canister of what Eve assumed to be oxygen sat on a rail underneath. Do you think I should come too? asked Eve. I see you, obviously, said the nurse, padding together her papers. She signed a form on a blue clipboard and placed it at the foot of the bed. You'll need these. They are ready for you down there. The porter turned back to look at the nurse. You okay? He asked. Yeah, she replied. This was a bad one. Anything I can do? Gin and a shoulder? I'm off duty after this. He shuffled awkwardly from one enormous foot to the other. The nurse smiled. Nice try, Farrell, but not tonight, thank you. She stood back and looked up at him. Same age as me, she is. Got me thinking, that's all. When you leave for work in the morning, you just kind of take it for granted that you'll make it home in one piece in the evening, don't you? But something like this, well, 
but for the grace of God, there go I. She crossed herself and cast her eyes to the heavens. Farrell shivered. You've got me all of a wobble, too, he said, puffing out a breath and patting his chest. So, said the nurse, shall we go? The door swung on its hinges, and Eve ran to catch up with the procession, pushing along the bloody and battered woman. The nurse helped Pharaoh maneuver the trolley into the lift. Tell them I'll be down to see her in the morning, she said. I just hope she makes it till then. Alone in the lift with the porter and the patient, Eve reached out to press the lift button before realizing that she didn't know which floor they were heading for. You'd better do it, she said, retreating to the corner. As the lift doors opened again, a buzz of medical staff swooped, whisking the trolley through to a small private room. The dim nightlights did little to mask the gravity of the high-tech equipment surrounding them. Eve followed them inside and stood by the wall, watching the team attach yet more machinery. There was a disturbing beeping sound, which halted when someone flipped a switch to, re to be replaced by a gentler ticking as the machines settled down to their collective duty of keeping the patient alive. Still, Eve wondered who the woman was, and why did they need Eve here? No one had told her she shouldn't be there, and no one tried to shoo her out of the way. Thinking back over the past few hours, no one had really taken any notice of her at all. It was a miracle that they had saved this poor woman. But what did it mean for Eve? Now seemed like a good time to go. It wasn't as if she could do anything to help, but she was so tired, so bone-achingly exhausted that she wasn't sure she had the energy to move. Perhaps she'd stay a little longer sit down here and get some rest. When she woke up later, she'd find out exactly what was going on. Chapter 2 One Day After the Accident When the door swung open, Eve jolted awake. She pulled herself to her feet, expecting stiffness from a night spent on the floor, but it was surprisingly absent. A nurse bustled in, blonde hair in a tight bun, tiny waist still visible beneath her shapeless scrubs. She pinched the woman's wrist with slender fingers, her gaze fixed on a distant point as she marked the beats. She wrapped a blood pressure cuff around the woman's arm, then checked the monitors before entering her findings onto the vast chart at the foot of the bed. I suppose we'd better get you ready for your visitors, for what it's worth, the nurse said. She tugged a blue plastic apron from a dispenser on the wall, slipped it over her head, and wrapped the ties around her waist, then plucked a pair of disposable gloves from a box. Eve put her fingers in her ears, not wanting to hear that awful squawk again. Gently, the nurse tucked a stray lock of hair back from the patient's face, revealing a swath of shaven scalp. The stark memory of bone beneath flesh flooded back. Eve blinked in an attempt to steady her swimming vision. Above the dressings, the woman's remaining lock splayed across the pristine pillow, a tawny fan around her head, sunshine on snow. Minus the blood from last night, there was some familiar familiarity to the woman's features. Eve thought a line to her jaw that reminded Eve of her sister. Her, si her insides clint clenched. <sighs> Eve looked away as the nurse completed her duties. This poor woman didn't need an audience. There, you're all nice and clean now, my lovely, said the nurse. Let's hope you don't give your family too much of a scare today. As she consigned her soiled apron and gloves to the relevant bins, the nurse's smile faltered as though a cloud had passed over her face. She held the door wide and beckoned to someone in the corridor. 
I'll be off then, said Eve. You need some time with your visitors. The arrival of visitors ought to be a private moment. This woman's family, her husband, parents, children maybe, would be distraught and Eve didn't want to get in the way. But then she stopped in her tracks, her stomach jolted. Eve's parents entered the room. Why were they here? What would compel them to visit some stranger in a London hospital miles from their home? On a Saturday morning, of all things, when they normally did their shopping, it had always been a battle to extricate her parents from their weekly routine, no matter how enticing the proposition. Mary, Eve's mother, turned to look at her husband, her face ashen, age and frailty etched into deep lines. Oh, Douglas, she said as he joined her, it really is her, isn't it? Douglas put his arm around his wife, who gingerly picked up the sleeping woman's hand, cupping it in her own. She's so cold. Look at her, all these tubes, my poor love. Oh, my goodness. Lowering herself into a chair by the side of the bed, she seemed to collapse inwards, as though someone had sucked out her skeleton and left the rest of her body to fend limply for herself. Eve moved towards her mother, but Mary leant away, tears coursing down her cheeks. It really is her, isn't it? She repeated between sobs. Bile rose to Eve's throat, her chest tightening, but where her heart ought to be pounding, there was calm, no heartbeat. I'd hoped we'd come in this morning, cried Mary, and it would all be some terrible mistake. And it wouldn't be our little girl lying in this bed. And then she'd call us and tell us they would got it wrong and that she was fine. It was just a Crap. case of mistaken identity or something. After all, it could be anyone underneath all that stuff, couldn't it? There had to be a ac rational explanation for this. But Eve's head reeled as one ludicrous idea after another flashed through her mind. The woman in the bed was a long-lost relation Eve had never met. Her mother had a child from a previous relationship whom she'd kept a secret all these years. A half-sister for Eve, maybe. Her parents had kept secrets from her for her entire life. But Eve knew none of this was true. Dread crawled into her core like a worm. She bent double, clutching at a chair for support. And then something howled something primeval the noise of an animal's suffering no one reacted no one else had heard it of course they had it because it had come from her from deep within from inside the woman no one knew was there moving towards the bed eve crouched down to read the name on the chart to confirm what she already knew eve chapman she read aloud but she was the only one who could hear buried. Everything hurt. She tried to curl into a small ball, cocoon herself from the outside world, shield her body from the pain, but she couldn't move. Arms were rigid at her sides, legs made of lead, and the darkness, like no darkness she had ever witnessed before. Darkness like the cold whisper of death. What had they done to her? Buried her alive? She was in a coffin beneath the dank earth, condemned to rot away. She would never get out. She was going to die here. It would be slow and painful. No one would know what had happened to her, that she was trapped, couldn't get out. Blood pumping too fast, heart pounding, dying slowly. Then voices, people were there, very close by. They were coming for her coming to get her, dig her out of this hole, prize open the coffin, help me, I'm alive, I'm in here, get me out of this place, please, her plea was small and insignificant, it didn't sound like her voice at all, because her mouth wasn't moving, the only voice she had was inside her own head, no one could hear her, 
The talking stopped, and there was a dull whoosh. A door closing? No, come back. Don't leave me. Please, don't go. When she stopped shouting in her head, she heard it. Someone was humming. A song she recognized from the radio. How could anyone hum at a time like this? But at least someone was still there, still here. That would mean they would get her out and she'd be fine. If she could hear people, then it would couldn't be a coffin. A room, perhaps? A prison cell? Dark. So dark. Terrible. Terrifying darkness. And then a pressure on her hand in the delicate place between bones and tendons. She'd felt it before, at the beginning. A squeezing and a rush. A warmth through her veins, heady and strong, like the first sip of gin on a Friday night. Stay calm, she thought. Breathe. Everything will be fine. She would think only happy thoughts from now on. Look. Here she was at the seaside. There was Nathan. She raised her hand to wave. Hey, Nathan. And Hattie, too, her sister. Her friends were all there. Her family. It was a party. Everyone was smiling, running in and out of the waves, screaming as the cold water hit their toes, but then running back in and doing it again. Everyone she loved was there, and they were all smiling at her good times, and then sleep. Chapter 3, One Day After the Accident. Eve sensed someone was watching her. She raised her head from her knees to see a face at the window. The man's hands cupped the glass, bright blue eyes darting between her and the woman on the bed, then resting on Eve. In her discomfort, she smiled, but he didn't return the gesture. He moved away, and Eve jumped up. She watched as he slouched down the corridor, broad shoulders hunched forwards, hands in pockets. She reached to push open the door, but stopped short. It was a compelling feeling of something pinning her there, as helpless as a scored butterfly. If it really was her body on that bed, then it was no longer as simple as turning around and walking away was it? With a rising sense of abandonment, she leaned against the wall and slid downwards once more, pulling her knees to her chest and resting her head. She was tired, so very tired. After her parents had left, her mother a sobbing wreck, her father pale and gaunt, Eve wanted to cry, but everything was dry, just so dry. Then her sister Hattie arrived with fat tears leaking from her eyes. Eve found it unbearable not to be able to offer comfort of any kind and was relieved when Hattie left. And finally, after five long hours, the door opened again and there stood Nathan. She thought she felt her heart ping in her chest, but knew it couldn't be real, separated from her as it now was beating away inside that useless body of hers. It wasn't until she saw the loose bow tie around Nathan's neck that Eve remembered where she should have been the previous evening. She had been looking forward to the ball for so long, longer than Nathan, most likely. If things were the other way around, she wouldn't have gone without him, nor would she have turned up here hours later with the nonchalant air of someone who had been drinking champagne all night. Hurt, betrayal, disbelief, sadness. Eve didn't know which felt worse. You have the cheek to turn up now like this, she said, the words sticking on her lips. How could you, Nathan? A kind of breathlessness seized her unbreathing frame. She charged towards him arms clenched across her chest like battering rams. She barreled into him with all her might, but Nathan didn't move, didn't react at all. Why would he? She was useless, powerless. The part of her with any physical strength was prostrate on the bed. 
the part of her with the thinking power had no physical strength at all. You should have been here sooner, she yelled. Mom and Dad came, and Hattie too. But where were you? Quaffing champagne and nibbling canopies, probably? God forbid anything should upset your perfect little world. As quickly as the furry had risen, it abated, and once again Eve slumped to the floor. She watched Nathan as he circled the bed, peering at the wires that disappeared down the front of her gown, tracking their path from her side to the many machines. Then he squinted at the monitors, all of which pumped out data she knew he wouldn't understand. He followed the line of the IV in her hand to the drip, then another tube from her nose to the cylinders of liquid food. He bent low over the bed, examining the dressings on her head, reaching out to touch them before changing his mind and recoiling. You're hoping it's not me, aren't you, she said. After all, she hadn't even recognized herself to begin with. You're hoping this is all some terrible mistake and you can go home, leaving this poor wretched soul for someone else to deal with. Let it become another family's problem, eh? I'm so sorry, Eve, said Nathan, collapsing onto the chair by the bed and taking Eve's free hand in his. I should have been here sooner. He wiped it a tear with the back of his hand. Yeah, too right you should. I don't know if you can hear me, but there was an incident at the gallery. Some terrorist thing, and they put us all in lockdown. The whole evening was a complete write-off. His voice was soft, almost inaudible through his, his tears. That's a bit of an elaborate story, Nathan, just to get out of coming to see me, said Eve. She couldn't understand why she felt so bitter towards him, but she could feel herself softening, even as the harsh words left her mouth. Why would he make up something like that? We weren't allowed to leave the building. When you didn't arrive, I kept checking my phone to see what was happening, but there was no message from you. I was so worried, Eve, but when I knew they weren't going to let us out for a while, I was glad you weren't there. And then I got the message from your dad, and I asked to leave, but they wouldn't let me. He put his head in his hands and sobbed. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, my darling girl. So bloody sorry I wasn't here with you. Eve wished she could take back the hurtful words she had thrown at him. Of course he would have come sooner. This was Nathan, the man she loved. And now you're like this. They say it's serious, he said, stifling another sob. I'll never forgive myself for not being here. Oh, Nathan, I wish you could hear me. It's going to be all right, she said to him, putting a hand he couldn't feel on his shoulder. It has to be. If only he could at least sense her presence somehow. If only she could make him understand that she wasn't in that body. But by some strange turn of events, she somehow stood beside him, around him, a broken, displaced spirit, desperate to reach out to those she loved and tell them that everything was going to be all right. Nathan rose and crossed the room. Eve went to him and slipped her arm around his waist, resting her head against his shoulder. It was comforting for her, even though there was no substance to the touch. When she looked up at him, his skin was pallid, tears streaming down his face. Please get better, my darling girl, said Nathan. I don't know what I'll do if you don't. Then, as though scared of waking her, he tiptoed from the room, his head bowed. It was too much, too painful. All Eve could do was close her eyes and sleep. Hello, said the man standing beside Eve, jolting her awake. She craned her neck to look up at him, blinking back the tiredness that dragged at her eyelids. Embarrassed to be caught sleeping, she hauled herself to her feet to find she only reached his shoulders. His eyes were a luminous blue and his blonde hair slightly too long, curling up gently over the collar of his white shirt. She was struck by how pristine, how perfect he looked, 
although there was a vagueness to his outline which she couldn't explain. Eve cleared the sleep from her throat. I saw you earlier, she said. You were out in the corridor. How come you can see me? Like this, I mean. She waved her hands to indicate her new body, this unfamiliar form which she now inhabited. That's right, said the man with a voice which was surprisingly deep. I'm sorry I walked off. I was hoping it wasn't going to happen to you, but it did. So you really can see me? This me? How is it that? Why is it only you that? Oh, I don't understand. Her hands went to her hair as she paced around the room. Who are you even? Do you work here or something? I'm Luca, said the man. And no, not really, but kind of, I suppose. Eve frowned. So why is it only that you can see me? None of my family can, nor my boyfriend. I thought he might at least be able to sense me in the room, but no. He couldn't see me, couldn't hear me, couldn't feel me at all. All everyone can see is that body on the bed. Everyone except you. Eve felt a tear begin its trail down her cheek and went to brush it away. But her hand touched thin air. A dry sob caught in her throat as she continued. We were meant to have gone to this ball, and I thought he had gone without me, and I was so cross with him. But of course, he wouldn't do something like that. I wanted to tell him everything was going to be okay, but I couldn't. She looked up at Luca. I'm sorry. I've only just met you, and I'm sure you're not interested in any of this. Her voice faded to a rasping whisper, and her shoulders drooped. Luca placed a hand on Eve's shoulder. Her skin tingled. It's fine, Eve, he said. You can tell me anything you like. How did I get like this? What's it all for, asked Eve. You need to be patient for now, said Luca. It takes time to fully understand it. Just take each day as it comes and try not to overload your mind with too much too soon. Focus your energy on that body over there. I'm getting it better. So how do you know who I am anyway, said Eve. It's on that big chart at the foot of your bed, along with numerous other things that I'm afraid I don't understand. Easy, really, Luca folded his arms and grinned. Oh, yes, of course. He had no right to mock her. She didn't even know the man. She leaned forward and squinted at him, one finger raised as though to prod him. So does that mean, does that mean you're, are you like me? I mean, are you, is your real body in a coma too? Is that why you can see me and no one else can? I'm afraid so, said Luca. Oh, God, said Eve, panic settling in now. Please don't tell me that there is a whole load of us floating about in the corridors, waiting to get back inside our bodies. This is all too much. Jesus Christ, it's like I'm starring in my own personal episode of The Walking Dead. I must be dreaming. This is a bloody nightmare. At some point, I'm going to wake up, aren't I? Pinch me, Luca. Can you pinch me, please? Luca laughed and Eve frowned. She didn't know how to process the information he was giving her, limited though it was. Everything she had once thought of as normal had disappeared dar during this most bizarre of days. Nothing made sense anymore. I'm afraid it's not quite as straightforward as that, said Luca. No, it wouldn't be, would it? You really just need to focus on yourself right now, he said. I know. You've said that already. Well, it's true. I can help you. What are you, some kind of therapist? Why do you want to help me? I'm no one to you. Lucas's face was hard to read. What was in this for him? Why was he getting involved? She didn't need him interfering. It made her uncomfortable. She had to get away. Maybe the fresh air outside would wake her up, and this really would turn out to be some kind of disturbing dream. Eve bolted for the door and tried to open it, not realizing there was no need. Eve, wait, called Luca, but she was already on the other side of the door. 
surprised at how she had arrived there with no effort at all, as though she had simply glided through it. She glared through the porthole at Luca, then turned her back on him and marched down the corridor. She made it just a few meters to the nurse's station, and then the pain set in. It was like a knife in her side, sharp and slicing. She cried out, and Luca was immediately beside her. Oh, my God, it hurts so much, she groaned, stumbling to a chair. How can I hurt so much when I can't feel anything else? It's a different kind of pain. You're not ready to go this far from your body yet. Like I said, you have to give it time. Build up your strength. Eve looked up at him. She knew he was trying to help. She knew she should be more pleasant to him, but it was so hard. Every inch of her wanted to shout and scream that this was all wrong, that the woman in the hospital bed wasn't her, that she shouldn't be here, that she needed to get back to her life. It will come, said Luca. In time, your strength will grow, and then you will be able to come out here into the corridor. You will be able to go even further to do things that will surprise you, just not yet. How much time? How long do I have to stay like this, she asked, her shoulders slumped. And anyway, what things? What on earth can I do in a body that doesn't really exist? You do exist, Eve, just not in the form that you're used to. Eve sighed. She glanced around her at the real world happening right in front of them, totally unaffected by their presence. A sign over the nurse's station read, Hush, please, in enormous red font. There was nothing hushed about anything on this ward, she thought, as a porter bustled past singing, When you're young and in love, and pushing an elderly woman on a squeaky trolley. An alarm screeched. A pair of doctors and scrubs sprang into action, heading for one of the side rooms close to Eve's. Nothing hushed about this place at all. How come none of these people saw what I just did, said Eve, that I passed through a door, for goodness sake? How on earth can you explain that? Her skin still tingled with the feel of it. It repulsed yet astounded her. I can't, Eve. I'm sorry, said Luca. I can't explain the physical stuff. I'm no expert on all this. I've just been like this a bit longer than you. Also, she interrupted, how come I can sit here on this chair without falling through it? How come I can do that when I just pass through that door like a fucking ghost? Like I said, I'm no expert, said Luca. I've always assumed it has something to do with your ethereal body, remembering what it used to do when it was inside your physical body. Like some kind of instinct, I suppose. A pattern of behavior. He shrugged his broad shoulders. She rolled her eyes at his response and turned away. Are you all right now, Eve? Can you get up? I'll take you back to your room. I think so, she said, creaking to her feet. Suddenly she felt winded, as though all the strength had left her. Luca placed an arm around her to keep her upright. What did you mean when you said I'll be able to do things that will surprise me? What can anyone do with a body that's made out of... What is it made out of? Air? Ether? Ether? Fairy fluff and cotton wool? What are we made of, Luca? Spotting a small mirror in the waiting area close to her room, she sprang ahead of him before realizing she didn't have the energy to make it there unaided. No, Luca yelled, pulling her back. Not yet. Why not, said Eve. I just want to see. No, he said again. No mirrors. Oh, for goodness sake, said Eve, her shoulders slumping. I know you're frustrated, Luca said. You want answers, and I can't give them to you. But try not to worry about anything for now. Come on, let's get you back. He put his arm gently around her waist as he led her to the door. I can feel you, said Eve, stopping to look up at him. But it's the weirdest thing. Different. Not like proper touch at all, but kind of just, I don't know, soft. We're trapped here, aren't we? 
How the hell are we going to get out of here? Christ, this really is a complete nightmare. Shh, now, you'll wear yourself out with all these questions, said Luca. Let's just get you back, okay? Why us, though? Why not all those other people lying in their beds in a coma? What's so special about us? Luca sighed. There's a lot you need to know, but not yet. For now, just remember not to go too far. Promise me that you won't try. Okay, but please don't make me go through that bloody door again. Not if you don't want to, said Luca. I really don't. Fortunately for Eve, a nurse was just leaving her room, and the door was still swinging on its hinges. There you go, safely back inside. The conventional way, said Luca, smiling. I have to go now, and you should get some rest. I'll see you soon, Eve. And before she could reply, he was gone. She was surprised at the noticeable rush of air as he left the room. And then it was as if he hadn't been there at all. And that's it for today, my peepers. Again, the book is I Let You Fall by Sarah Downing. I gave this five stars. I could not put this down, and I read it all in one day. So Eve Chapman had an accident, and she's in a coma. She can hear her family and friends, but cannot speak back. Eve also has... Hold on. She's also above her bed in spirit and can't figure out what is going on. Then she meets Luca, who is also in a coma, and he helps her cope with what is going on. The intensity of this book and what goes on with these two and what they have to do was just so heartwarming. I had all the feels all rolled up in these pages. You meet families who are going through rough times and spend a lot of time at the hospital. So I received this book from the publisher for review, and now I want to read more of this author's book, so I need to find them. And this book came out in June, so it is available for purchase. The link will be down below. I hope that you enjoyed this book as much as I did when I first started reading it. And the link, again, is down below. It is my Amazon affiliate link. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.